Today, we are delighted to have Professor Marla Miller with us. Marla is an associate professor and director of the public history program at UMass Amherst. Her first book, The Needle's Eye, was a study of women's work in the, in the clothing trades with an aim to restore, the, to view the skilled craftswomen who, who worked in New England's clothing trades. Today, she will be discussing her newest book, Betsy Ross and the Making of America, a scholarly biography of that most misunderstood early American craftswoman, Betsy Ross. Please join me in, in welcoming Marla Miller. Uh, what I thought I would do in our time together, since the theme of the series is women's work, is first say a few words about how I came to write this book, because it says a little bit about the history of women's history, of which this series is a part. Second, I'm going to give you a very quick kind of thumbnail overview of Betsy's life. And then I want to spend some time talking about her artisanal work uh, in the upholstery trades, as well as the making of flags. So I'm a historian of women and work by training, and I'm particularly interested in intersections between gender and artisanal skill in early America. Uh, my first book, which Jamie mentioned, The Needle's Eye, Women and Work in the Age of Revolution, is an effort to restore to view women in that um, picture of 18th century artisanry. And I got interested in that because uh, a long time ago I was doing work on a woman named Rebecca Dickinson, who was a gown maker in Hatfield, Massachusetts. She left behind a very uh, moving and painful diary about her experience as a woman alone in the early republic. And as I was working on her life, I could see that she was a gown maker. There was trace evidence of that in the diary. And I wanted to write about how she was able to support herself as a woman without access to male resources. And so, you know, I went off to the library thinking I would just pull a book off the shelf about gown making in early America. And I discovered that, lo and behold, not only was there nothing really about gown making in early America of a scholarly nature, but um, there was very little about women in any sort of skilled craft trade. Most of the scholarship on craft in early America looked at trades practiced by men, things like silversmithing, house carpentry, and most scholarship on women's work focused on domestic labors, things women did within and for their household. So I became interested in looking at women's work at that intersection of craft, skill, and gender, and I set out to do this work about women in the clothing trades. Now, that book opens with a little bit of a conversation about how we think about early American women and why we don't tend to remember that they were skilled workers. And so I talk a little bit about the uh, early American good wife of popular historical imagination, that sort of, you know, the heroic good wife who got up in the morning and spun some candles and, or spun some yarn and dipped some candles and then, you know, went off to the loom and wove her own cloth and sewed her own clothing and basically did a heroic amount of work that, that we really know, using our common sense, that no woman could have done for her own household. But I was interested in how we come to think about women that way. And so the book opens with a little contemplation of that. And I use a couple of figures to get at that. And this is one of them, Colonial Barbie. <laughs> She's one of my favorite artifacts in American history. But as you can see, when Mattel was thinking about this doll that would represent early American women and they needed to give her a prop, what did they come up with? A little piece of needlework. Because if we imagine early American women, they must be sewing. That also led me to Betsy Ross. Betsy Ross, I knew, was an upholsterer by trade, but in popular historical imagination, she's a seamstress. And I wondered, what is that about women, ma women making furniture that's so hard to reconcile with popular historical imagination? So that was really the beginning of the search for Betsy Ross, because I knew that her life looked less like this than like this. This is an engraving of uh, an upholstery shop interior from an encyclopedia by a guy named Diderot, who's, this is an image of a French shop, but this, and this is the detail of those women working in the background, is the world that I wanted to recover. If you look back at this shop, whoops, now I gotta learn how to go in reverse. Nope. Okay. Um, if you look back at this shop and you see the work going on, in the lower left you see the upholsterer showing a client some of their wares. If you look in the top right, you see a workman bringing a stack of mattresses down. And then here you see these five women who are working on the sewing. And that's really what I want to draw your attention to by the end of our time together today. But if you look at the sort of gender balance of that shop, 
there are more women working here than men. So here too, when I um, started to work on Betsy Ross, or when I started to think about Betsy Ross as a historical figure, I went off to the library once again thinking I will just pull a book off the shelf, a footnote to this, you know, really in passing moment in my first book, and find out about the real Betsy Ross. And lo and behold, when I went to WorldCat, this big database that some of you may know, there were a couple hundred titles about Betsy Ross in WorldCat, and almost all of them juvenile literature. There were a couple of books that were written by descendants who were eager to claim the veracity of the flag legend and demonstrate its uh, accuracy, but there was nothing scholarly about Betsy Ross, nothing that tried to put her in the context of 18th century Philadelphia, of women's work, of the revolution itself. Um, as many of you know, uh, she rose to prominence in the late 19th and early 20th century, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on today, but she became in many ways a cartoon figure. And the bicentennial uh, helped convey that to many of us. And so you see some of the tchotchke here. I, uh, I used to always say that Betsy Ross became the salt to George Washington's pepper. And then um, lo and behold, I found a salt and pepper shaker. And so that's Betsy Ross in the lower right. But uh, instead of George Washington, it turns out her history boyfriend is George Mason, the father of the Bill of Rights. So who knew? Um, so many people have asked me over time how it could be that there is no book yet about Betsy Ross. And the obvious answer is that she left no papers. She was not famous during her, her lifetime for having made any flags. Um, there was one letter known to have been written by her in the 1980s, that's now lost. And so there really is no paper trail to follow, which helps explain why historians haven't really had the tools to write about her until the advent of these powerful databases that we use today. Also problematic along these lines is that the archival record that does survive is actively misleading. Betsy Ross, as you'll learn in a moment, was married three times. This is the ad placed for her shop uh, after she was married to John Claypool. Now, if you didn't know that this was the shop of Betsy Ross, you couldn't learn it from this ad. And so newspaper ads, city directories, these kinds of sources that historians use often fool us so that we can't see the real ways that women worked in the world. So when I set out now to begin this work, recovering the life of Betsy Ross, I had to think about where to begin. And as Jamie mentioned, I direct the public history program at UMass Amherst, so I knew the kinds of deep scholarly resources that museums and historic sites like this one generate. So my first stop was the Betsy Ross House in Philadelphia. Has anyone been there? A few people, very good. Um, I went down there and started going through their research files, and it became obvious to me that the place to begin to recover the life of Betsy Ross were a series of affidavits that were made in the 19th century. The legend can be tracked to this woman. This is Clarissa Claypool Wilson, Betsy's daughter, who in 1857 asked her nephew, William Canby, to take down this story that her mother told her about making the first United States flag. So it's 1857, the Civil War intervenes, Canby doesn't do much with that, but in 1870, he prepares a talk that he gives to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, in which he delivers this report, as he likes to call it, of his family story, the making of the flag. Now, he really did try to document this. He went through the archival sources that were available to him at that time, looking for evidence that this story is correct. He couldn't find anything. So what he did in lieu of that was ask his family members to make their way to various attorney offices and uh, sign an affidavit affirming the story as they remember hearing it. One of Betsy's daughters, and only one, was still living at that time. This is Rachel in a portrait miniature of her taken as a young woman. And again, describing this scene that I want to keep reminding you of. So in the affidavits, they're mostly telling the story about the making of the first flag. But along the way, they tell other stories. And those became the opening for me to start seeing a bigger picture in Betsy's life. So I want to share with you a passage from one of those. So this is from Rachel's, and she's talking about the 1760s when Betsy walked to, from her family's Art Street house down the street to an upholstery shop, the uh, business of a guy named John Webster, 
And she was there, now I'm reading from the affidavit, to visit her sister. While there, a piece of difficult work was given to one of the girls who failed in it, and Betsy said she could do it and surprised Mr. Webster by the neatness and beauty of her work. He at once went to her mother's and asked her to let him have Betsy, who at first was unwilling to let her go. Mr. Webster offered to pay Grandmother Griscom the wages of a woman in the kitchen and give Betsy a thorough knowledge of the business, so her mother yielded. So we learn a few things from this little story. It's told to preserve this image of Betsy as the quick-witted young woman, the needlework prodigy who would go on to make the first flag. But along the way, we learn that one of Betsy's older sisters, who would be Susanna, Sarah, Rebecca, or Mary, her oldest sister, Deborah, already being married and out of the house, was already working in Webster's shop when Betsy visited there, since one of the girls is having trouble. And we also know, since it's one of the girls, that there's more girls working there than just her. So at least three girls, and maybe more, again, maybe five, young women were working in this upholstery shop under the supervision of a woman named Ann King, who, quote, had the care of women's work in Webster's enterprise. The upholsterer is remembered to have approached Betsy's mother, not her father, for permission to hire her and offered to pay her the wages of a kitchen maid, which at that time would have been 10 or 12 pounds a year, in exchange for the novice's labor under his supervision. So it should not surprise us that Betsy Ross winds up working in an upholstery shop. And I want to say that um, she was one of many artisans in her family. Many people ask me when I travel to give talks whether she was unusual in that she ran this upholstery shop throughout her life. And I remind people that she came from an artisanal family. Her great-grandfather was a house carpenter. Her father was a house carpenter. Her sister, Deborah, who was out of the house, worked in a cloth dyeing shop. She had a sister who was a mantua maker. Her brother was a silversmith. So when she was a young girl, it wasn't a question of whether she would go to work. It was a question of what job she would enter. So with that, let me give you a little bit of an overview of her life sort of writ large, and then I want to turn back to the upholstery trades in particular. She was born Elizabeth Griscom in 1752 to Quaker parents Samuel Griscom and Rebecca James. She grew up on Art Street in a house her father built, which would have been just this side of the steeple that you see to the left there in the image. In 1773, she married John Ross, he was the son of an Anglican minister. This is his father, Aeneas. Uh, she was, of course, estranged from her Quaker faith for marrying outside the faith. Um, I have a good story about that if anybody wants to hear it in the Q&A. Uh, John Ross was another upholsterer in the shop. He was training with Webster, so they met at work, um, married, and set out their own shop uh, shortly after John finished his uh, obligation to Webster. And I should say that Betsy and John do have a connection to Boston. Almost as soon as the map of the seat of civil war in New England was released in Philadelphia in 1775, Betsy and John raced out to buy a copy and hung it on their wall, although their landlord, they were of course renters, uh, was a Tory in inclination. So that's her uh, one connection to Boston. She was totally on your side. Uh, John and Betsy had eloped to Hug Tavern. That's another reason that she was estranged, of course, from the Quaker community. But the marriage was brief. He died in January 76 under somewhat uh, mysterious circumstances. So she's a widow already in January of 76. The independence meeting movement is heating up. And this is the season, oh, here's where they eloped to Hug Tavern in New Jersey and her marriage license. So in, in the spring of 76, she is a young widow. And this is the season that the flag episode is supposed to have occurred. And I'm going to come back to this when I talk about her flag making. So I'll just ask you to hold that image in your mind. This was done by her great grandnephew, uh, Joseph Boggs Beale, who was the premier magic lantern artist of the 19th century. And he created this uh, imagining of the scene in her parlor. Not long after she was widowed, she remarried a man named Joseph Ashburn. He was a mariner by trade and turned privateer during the war. So he was away while Betsy was in Philadelphia during the occupation. He was captured at sea and taken to this prison in England where he died, probably of some sort of disease that was running through the prison. So that was a very short marriage, uh, but it did yield to her first children. He had, she had two daughters, 
with Ashburn, one of whom survived infancy. So she married a third time, John Claypool. Claypool was also active in the revolution. He also turned privateer. He was also captured at sea. And so he was already in Mill Prison when Betsy's husband, Ashburn, arrived there. The two men became friends in prison. And when Claypool was released, you know, when all of the prisoners were released and he returned to Philadelphia, he paid a courtesy call on the widow Ashburn, as one would, and within a matter of months, they are married. This is the man with whom she had her family, by and large, and raised her family. So this is her family tree as it becomes. Um, and you can see that their uh, children and grandchildren also remain in the trade. Um, so Betsy had seven daughters, six of whom lived to adulthood. And over time, some of those girls, and particularly Clarissa, moved back to their mother's house uh, and Betsy wound up raising not just her daughters, but some of her grandchildren, and also her nieces as her sisters became widowed and then died. So Betsy's household actually grew larger through the course of her life, not smaller. So Betsy Ross experienced a lot of change over the course of her life. She worshipped in at least three, maybe four, communities of faith. She married and buried three husbands and lived in rented rooms all of her life around Philadelphia. The one constant throughout her life was her work, and that's what I want to turn to now. Upholsters like Betsy Ross were immersed in luxury. Oh, there are her glasses. She retired around 1827. She worked into her 70s to help support this large family. Upholsterers worked with the finest materials that were available in any city. Uh, much of their work was fashioning stylish and comfortable interiors. Um, they worked with stuffing and covering of furniture. And some of the things I'm going to show you now, I want to walk through some of the products that came out of upholstery shops in this period. Few 18th century households, uh, household goods were as desirable among consumers or as lucrative for the makers as beds. Beds in the 18th century, as many of you know, were a way to show wealth and conspicuously consumed these vast amounts of materials. Their cost made them rare. Between 1700 and 1775, only about half of Philadelphia households contained bedsteads, meaning the wooden frame. And of these, only about a quarter to a third were embellished with hangings. Betsy's family had been fortunate in this regard. Her great-grandfather, Andrew Griscom, the house carpenter, had helped build Philadelphia. He was a very wealthy man, uh, so his household, when he died, contained two fully dressed beds, and each of them were worth more than a 16-acre parcel they also owned in Pennsylvania. So that gives you some sense of the importance of these artifacts. Uh, historians have talked about the way the curtains envelop the person inside the bed, and a historian named John Crowley has said that beds were as much a place as a thing. And I like that architectural image of them and thinking about the women who made them as part of the craftspeople who did that. So here are some damask bed curtains that survive at Winterthur that give you a sense of the kinds of things that Betsy would have made and the material she worked with. It involves a lot of that sort of long seaming, as you can see, that's the same kind of work she'll do in flag making. And also the manufacture of trimming, like you see there, the cutting of the valance and the application of trim. That's the kind of work women sitting around that table were doing. She also spent a lot of time making tassels. Uh, her supervisor that I mentioned uh, earlier, Ann King, would in 75 go out on her own with an advertisement where she called herself the um, first, maker of, first American maker of tassels who has brought that art to any state of perfection. Now, when she's doing that in 1775, it's all part of the Buy American campaign, right? Trying to get people to uh, consume you know, domestically made goods, not imported goods. But these are the kinds of things that these women would have fabricated. And as you might guess, it's very painstaking work. Um, clients might come in and order you know, 40 or 50 of these at a pop, wealthy clients. And I, I sometimes wonder when that order comes in, you know, does the craftswoman's heart rise or sink? Because that had to be that kind of tedious, or tedious labor that people do sitting around those tables. Another important part of the upholsterer's trade that these women would have had a hand on is making the sacking bottom and mattress. Uh, 
So here's a detail of a sacking bottom. I'm sure many of you know the phrase sleep tight. Many of you are familiar with rope beds uh, that were used in this period. A more comfortable rest was provided by the sacking bottom, which if you can imagine it, is laid out and then those eyelets help string that sacking bottom to the frame of the bed so that the mattress can rest on top of it. And so a, a well-heeled client would prefer a sacking bottom. And again, if you can look closely up the middle, you see the sort of heavy stitching required to assemble that. And then if you can imagine you know, creating these eyelets, again, that's hard, heavy work. That's not the sort of light sewing we all often think about with seamstresses. Of course, the mattress goes on top of that. Um, mattresses were filled with all manner of things in the 18th century. Um, feathers were, of course, the most desirable thing, but uh, various hair products recovered from animals were probably the second most popular thing. And then plant material would be the kinds of fillings you would use in a servant's bed, for example. But upholsters spent a lot of time making and filling mattresses um, if you can think about the way a duvet cover has those channels in it to keep the uh, feathers from you know, lumping together, they would create those channels, stuff the mattresses, and those things would need to be refreshed, as you might guess, fairly often. And so wealthy families would have women, including uh, Betsy's sister, who shows up in these kinds of records, come every year and refresh their mattresses. So that, too, was an important part of the upholstery trade for women like Betsy Ross. Window curtains were also an important part of women's work. And if you can see the way these are draped um, so gracefully at the top, these are curtains from the Powell House in Philadelphia. This too is part and parcel of the trade, not just in bed curtains, but in window curtains. This is a period where well-heeled clients become interested in having their rooms you know, more en suite, and so your bed and window curtains might match. And, and the fabricator, would apply little uh, rings to the back of things that had threads moving through them so that when you draw the curtains up, they drape ever so gracefully. And creating those graceful drapes, too, was part of women's work in the upholstery trades. Venetian blinds, also very important. The shop where Betsy learned her craft, the Webster shop, was one of the first to introduce Venetian blinds to Philadelphia. Uh, they were very popular. Uh, and I'll, let me read you a passage for, uh, from one ad. Blinds are, quote, the greatest preserver of furniture of anything of that kind ever invented. Um, people then knew what we know now, that sunlight bleaches furniture, bleaches fabric, and so Venetian blinds gave you a way to protect your investment in the expensive fabric uh, that you've put all around your, your living room or your bedroom. And also, um, there's a nice ad that talks about how they, uh, in a city setting, prevent you from being overlooked, which means you could emit a little bit of light, emit a little bit of uh, air, but uh, your neighbors couldn't peer in and see what you were doing. So Betsy and John Ross made these in their shop. John would um, you know, make the lathes, bring the, or build it, and Betsy would create those tapes. That, uh, that connect the lathes together. So Venetian blinds, too, an important part of their overall trade. And for Betsy, probably the most important thing she did was make chair covers. Today, we call them slip covers. We're just as interested in them now as we were then. Again, if you've invested a lot of money in damask chairs or a damask easy chair, you don't really want people actually sitting on it. And so you can have a nice slip cover made out of a functional fabric. You can have that on. You can take it off when you're wanting to reveal your expensive fabric. You can use them seasonally. And some people would use them, again, to make a room en suite. So you might have bought a set of things at different times, but then you get a set of slip covers, and everything now you know, coordinates. So a, a large part of her work was actually making these kinds of goods. So this all, this universe of things, is the sort of sewing and fabricating that Betsy Griscom and women like her tackled the bread and butter of any upholstery shop. And I want to say here in Boston, there's just one kind of uh, counterpart who helps us imagine Betsy Ross, a woman named Elizabeth Kimball, who cut the cloth, assembled and lined panels, and applied braid and binding for as many as 40 to 60 sets of bed hangings a year, earning about a shilling a day for that work. So that gives you some point of comparison. Of course, it's flag making that we remember her for. Flags entered her enterprise during the revolution, if not before. 
According to the legend, and now here this is the famous rendering of this moment by Charles H. Weisgerber, according to the legend, in spring 76, George Washington, George Ross, and Robert Morris came to her shop and asked her to make a flag. In the legend, Washington comes with a little sketch. He gives it to her and says, what do you think? And she says, yeah, you know, I could do that, but you know, these six-pointed stars, you know, let me recommend five-pointed stars and let me tell you why. And she is, you know, said to have folded a piece of paper just so, snipped it, out comes this perfect five-pointed star. And he says, yeah, that's outstanding, go with that. Uh, in the legend, they are said to have made a specimen flag that they take back to Congress. Congress says, hooray, and, and that's it. We adopt our national flag. So obviously, an important part of my work in the book was figuring out what, if any of that, uh, could be correct. And um, a few things you know, came up immediately. Washington was in Philadelphia that spring. He was acquiring many, many things that the Army needed. And so there's no reason to doubt that he was going around to upholstery shops. He also picked up the tents that today survive at the Smithsonian and at Valley Forge on that same trip from upholster Plunkett Fleeson. So no problem with Washington. George Ross was Betsy's uncle, the uncle of her husband, John. He would have known that she was recently widowed and in need of work. And so it makes sense that he would lead a little you know, party to her shop saying, can you do something for us? However, Ross was not a member of Congress in spring of 76. He comes to Congress in August. And so this cannot be a congressional delegation led by Ross. The third member of that party, Robert Morris, opposed independence in spring of 76. So it's unlikely that he would be serving on a committee assigned with the getting of a new flag for a nation that has not yet declared independence. So parts of those stories don't add up. Of course, there's no record of Congress of any specimen flag coming, and there would be. And so those kinds of things don't add up. But other things do. That winter, 75, 76, we start to see the creation of a navy to advance the colonial rebellion. Women across Philadelphia are getting contracts for the suites of flags that are needed for those ships. And flags are not optional. In the 18th century, they are utilitarian goods, part of a ship stores that are urgently needed to communicate information across long distances. And so other milliners, other craftswomen are getting contracts for these flags. And the point that I like to make about Betsy Ross is she is, again in this spring, as a widow, an aspiring government contractor. She sees that women around the city are getting on the sort of government payroll. She would like to be one of them. And the important thing about her story to me as a woman interested in women's artisanal work is that when she does this little trick, which I also have no reason to doubt about the cutting of the paper and the six stars, six points to five, I think what she's showing Washington is if you need a lot of these and fast, five pointed stars are easier to make. Let me show you why. So she's thinking as a craftsperson, not as a designer, not as somebody creating symbolism. She's thinking about somebody trying to make a lot of these quickly. There's only one surviving receipt for flag making during the American Revolution. It's for a flag that she made for the Pennsylvania Navy in 77. I don't know of any other archival evidence of her flag making during the Revolution, but of course the Revolution records are really quite scattered. The best evidence of her flag making work comes in the early 19th century in the run up to the War of 1812 when I have evidence of dozens of flags that she made for the Schuylkill Arsenal. She was pretty much the sole flag maker for the Arsenal in that window of time because she was very good friends with Tench Cox who was the purveyor of public supplies. Good guy to know. So most of her enterprise in flag making at this time were very, very large garrison flags. The one on the left is the garrison flag that survives at Fort Niagara today and Indian flags, flags for the Indian department that were sent with Western expeditions as trade goods. So the garrison flag is more familiar to us. She made many, many of these, as I say, I've seen them shipped to New Orleans, I've seen them shipped all over the place. And some of these, if you were to lay them out, were larger than the footprint of her home. So they, again, very, very large order, sometimes six at a time, where her daughter, her nieces, all hands would have been on deck for this work, I'm sure. The Indian flags are made with the collaboration of a flag painter because the, the eagle in the canton is painted on. She worked with a guy named William Barrett. Uh, 
and again, you know, she would assemble basically the backdrop for that, he would do the painting, and off those flags would go. And so I always remind people, you know, if you see any of these popular images of Betsy Ross, they always show her in her parlor. And I want to remind people that her horizons were broad. Those flags flew from Niagara to New Orleans, up and down the Mississippi Valley, and so her perspective on the world was very broad and very much global. So I want to close here by circling back to where I started, and that's with the history of women's history. I mentioned that we owe this story very much to Clarissa. Betsy Ross died in 1836. Her death notice in the paper makes no reference to any flags. She was not famous during her lifetime in any way. Clarissa had joined her mother in the flag-making business. She worked beyond her mother's death another 20 years before she retired in 1857, planning to move out to Iowa to live with her daughter's family. Before she left the city, as I mentioned, she sits her nephew down and tells him this story. Why does she do it? I think it's because the history of the revolution is starting to take shape. A canon, if you will, is beginning to form. And so John Fanning Watson begins to publish his Annals of Philadelphia, celebrating the heroic deeds of many Philadelphia women, several of whom Betsy knew, some of whom she was related to. That work starts to come out in the, in the public press. In the 1840s, Elizabeth Ellet publishes the first history of women in the Revolution. Again, celebrating all of these deeds done by women that they knew. Betsy Ross, not among them. And then I think the thing that really uh, must have done it for Clarissa is that the first history of the flag comes out. And in it, the author basically says, we just don't know that much about the first flag. I wish we'd kept better track of that. And so I think Clarissa starts to see these stories come out and thinks, you know, my mother has a story too, and I want to be sure that we get that down. And so I think that's what motivated her to really make sure that this story survived her and survived her departure from Philly. Again, Betsy Ross never knew what it was to want employment, in her own words. Her life gives us a view not just into the world of working women in revolutionary America who made the new nation possible. To be sure, the tangible traces of her life scattered over time, obscuring historical truths and making way for myths and legends. Only a few possessions survive today for inspection. The places where she was born, where she grew up, where she first learned her trade, and where she raised her young family are all gone. Hug Tavern, the scene of her elopement, was torn down in 1929. The buildings on Front Street that so, for so many years sheltered her shop and family have been demolished. And the neighborhood where she died was raised in the 1950s to make way, ironically enough, for Independence Mall. The Arch Street home that survives today must stand for houses and workrooms all over Philadelphia that must, once sheltered her considerable enterprise. Betsy Griscom, Ross, Ashburn, Claypool may indeed seem elusive, but her life nevertheless helps us contemplate the revolution and its aftermath in new ways. She's important to our understanding of American history not because she made any one flag, however iconic that moment may have become, but because she was a young craftswoman who embraced the resistance movement with vigor, celebrated its triumphs, and suffered its consequences. Her story is worth knowing for what it tells us about working women and men who built early America's cities, furnished its rooms, and closed its citizens, and because she helps us imagine more ordinary times, the familiar cares of everyday life, and the pleasure taken in the simple comforts of beautiful and functional things made by capable hands. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions? Again, if you do, please wait for me to come around with the microphone. Yes, sir. At, at the outset, you pointed out that Betsy Ross is often portrayed as a seamstress, but was really an upholsterer. Uh, how much difference is there there, and how much crossover? I mean, if she didn't have any furniture to upholster, would she become a seamstress for a couple of weeks? Right. Um, I think the thing that the, the, the main misapprehension that I want to clarify when people think of her as a seamstress is that she didn't make clothing. And I think it would be fair to call her an upholstery seamstress, although then I think that it's hard to remember the making of the mattresses and the Venetian blinds and the other things she did. But a lot of popular imagination 
thinks that she would then have been a dressmaker or could have made clothing. And the, the family, unfortunately, helps perpetuate that because one of the memories that get, that's really muddled and I don't know what to make of in the book is that Betsy's daughter thinks that her mother told her about the time she made ruffles for George Washington's shirt. And, you know, there's just no plausible way I can get that story to add up at all. Um, so that's the main thing that I try to steer people towards is, is that a seamstress, I think in many minds, makes people think about making and mending clothing. And I want to keep people thinking about furniture and domestic interiors. That's a good question. Uh, where would they have gotten the material? Because obviously they didn't, well, I shouldn't say obviously, they didn't make the materials that they worked with to upholster with. Was that a bone of contention that it was coming from England? Were they trying to do local? I, I wonder very much about that during the revolution. I mean, it would have been imported goods. Do you want to feel that? That would be great. Um, yeah, oh, next. Um, yeah, um, I know there can be curators in the audience who often know more about these things than I do, so I'm always happy to yield the floor. Um, yeah, it would have been imported goods and it's interesting, just as non-importation takes off, they get an order for some calico curtains from Benjamin Chu. It's part of a large order when his daughter gets married. And I, when I found that, I wondered about that. You know, were they, you know, as non-importation takes hold, are they having to split some hairs and say, well, Chu really bought that before this. You know, that doesn't really count. Chu had that on hand. Um, but mainly clients are supplying these things or they're getting them from imported shops. But yeah, it's, this is all imported goods. And so during the revolution itself, I think um, that A, became dicey, and B, during the revolution, I think work just must have come almost to a halt. Betsy did spend some time making munitions during the uh, revolution and possibly as an alternative revenue source. Uh, during the talk, you had mentioned there was an interesting story uh, you would discuss. Oh, about her disownment. Yeah. Thank you for remembering and asking, you, asking that because I, I love this. And it does tell something about how I went about writing the book without archival material. Uh, Betsy Ross was a Quaker, as I mentioned, and was disowned from the Quaker faith for marrying John Ross. And people make a lot of that in Philadelphia. And it's a great romantic story. You have the elopement across the river and the heat of rebellion. It's right before the, the Tea Party incident here. One of the very first things I did when I started the book was look at the Quaker records because they're excellent. And Betsy was one of 17 children, so I looked at all of the kids, trying to put her in the context of her family. And I found out that when Betsy was disowned for marrying outside the faith, she, her parents were five for five. All of her older sisters had also married outside the faith. And, um, and th so they had all undergone this process by which the faith restores unity. And in, the, in that process, a team of Quakers is dispatched to the errant member and they're to discuss with them you know, their error and see if they are genuinely um, repentant. And if they are, then they come back to the, the meeting and they accept a public reading of uh, a testimony against them. And then all, all's well. And why this particular story is so meaningful to me is that Betsy's two closest older sisters are both disowned right around the same time, one for marrying outside of unity, one for having an illegitimate child. The process by which unity is restored is typically about a six-month discussion. Betsy's older sisters drag it out for over a year. You know, month after month goes by, and they keep putting the Quakers off, Yes, I'm sorry. No, I'm not. Maybe I am. I'm just not sure. Yes, I am. I'll come. Oh, no, not this week. Next week, next month, next month. So it just drags out, drags out, drags out. And when I then get to Betsy's disownment, and I want to see how she handled that same process, they come to her house and they initiate the discussion. And she says, you know what? Not coming back. Don't need to do it. You know, I'll be joining my husband at Christ Church. And so one of the things that all of that helps me see is, and again, this is eye of the beholder, but a very decisive personality. You know, while her sisters were on the fence for months and months and months about how to handle this situation, when it comes to Betsy, she knows what she's gonna do and she goes. Um, the same thing turns out to be true in her three marriages. Uh, the two where she marries as a widow are both, again, statistically well below the average time of remarriage for Quaker women in this time. And again, you know, I, it's a lot of inference, but I see in that a woman who is um, 
you know, knows what she wants and, and just, you know, isn't afraid to pursue it. Now, I will say, you know, that is the eye of the beholder. Somebody else could say, well, isn't she a Klingon vine who just can't get along, you know, without being married? But I see in, in, in those, you know, just deviations from other practice a very decisive mind. So, um, so that those, her Quaker records were really important to me. Any more questions? Oh. Her name, Betsy Ross, the, the name of her first husband, was that the custom at the time not to, not to take your subsequent husband's I name? I know, I know, I know. Everybody always asks me this, and, and I've got to come up with a better answer. Um, no, it is not. And she was Elizabeth Ashburn while she was married to a Ashburn, and she was Elizabeth Claypool for most of her life. And her children, who enshrined her in American memory, were all Claypools who nevertheless call her Betsy Ross in their memory. And so why might that be? I really, I don't have a theory that even, even I'm convinced by, but the, um, the theory that I'm working with, until I come up with something better, is uh, that the 1777 receipt that I mentioned is the only surviving receipt from the revolutionary era. It comes in May of 77, and as you may know, the Flag Act is, is June of 77. So people trying to prove that the legend is correct have turned themselves inside out to make that receipt, the, you know, because it's May and then June. People just want them to be connected. And so I think remembering her as Betsy Ross m m helps that receipt become relevant to that story. And that's, that's the best I can do because, no, she would have been Elizabeth Claypool. I know she's working. I know she's working as a young girl, but I'm getting the feeling that she really was quite prosperous, and no, oh. not the real upper classes. Yeah. But she's not a farm girl, and she's not a mill girl. Yeah, yeah. And I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, her finances are very mysterious to me. Uh, I'll say a couple of things. One is that every generation of this family did a little worse than the one before. Uh, yeah, worse. When Andrew Griscom comes from England and is one of the few house carpenters when Philadelphia is undergoing its very first building boom, he becomes very wealthy. They're in the top, top, top of early Philadelphia. And then, you know, their kids aren't that great and their kids are a little less and, you know, it kind of skids downhill from there. Um, Betsy's father, very prosperous, upper middle class house carpenter, um, he died in the yellow fever epidemic. Both of her parents died in that epidemic. Their family, you know, kind of on the skids. Betsy and John were up and down. There is evidence that they owned a carriage briefly, which is very unusual for Philadelphians. And yet, John Claypool, you know, he works for the Customs Service, so he's got a decent income. Oh, I guess what I'm trying to say is their finances are just like this. One minute they're doing great, the next minute they're not doing well. And there's even contradictory evidence at the same time. So John Claypool had a stroke about 1800. He was paralyzed to some degree. It's hard to know exactly what. But they're receiving charity from the Quaker Church at that time. Tuition money for the kids, money for shoes for John, for clothes for John. So if you just have the Quaker records, they are really hanging on by a thread. On the other hand, this is the same season that she's getting the contracts for those enormous flags. This is the year that that portrait miniature of her daughter is made. That's quite a nice little portrait. And so even at the same time, it's very hard to get a grip on her finances. And so what I wound up concluding is that they're just precarious. You know, this is, I should mention, the era before banks. And one of the most exciting moments in the research is when I found Betsy Ross's bank account in the uh, Philadelphia Savings Fund Society. They were very late joiners to this emerging trend um, of saving for a rainy day. So, um, so yeah, her finances really were. They're very unpredictable. That's a great question. Final question. I was just curious, in, in the Quaker religion, did you have to give up your husband? Um, no, you did not. I mean, you just, you just had to express sincere remorse. And two of her sisters, I should say, restored unity and went back to their Quaker meeting, and two did not. So, you know, the, and her parents were also um, disciplined for marrying outside of unity. So it was hard for the Quakers to keep that enforced.
So a huge thank you to Marla thank you. today. Thank you all for coming out.